Okay, good evening, everyone. I guess this is a really important topic to all of us. Um, welcome to our first training event of spring 2022. I'm Dr. Julie Tenniel, Principal Investigator and Project Director for our HRSA funded program we've branded EPIC for Education and Programming and Integrated Care. And as always, I'd like to express my tremendous gratitude to the team behind the scenes. This includes, of course, Wendy Myers, our grant program coordinator, Fatima Bakioko, our graduate assistant, Sarah Fisher, our research assistant, and Dr. Cheryl Neal McFall, co PI and program evaluator. We are so excited about our presenters tonight, and we'll introduce them momentarily. So the goal of this research and training grant is to expand numbers of well-trained MSW, MED school counseling, and PsyD professionals working with children, adolescents, and transitional age youth in high need and high demand areas capable of delivering evidence-based health services, behavioral health services in our region and beyond. Let me tell you about our great presenters tonight that everybody is so excited to hear from. So first we have Lisa Christian, LCSW, who is Director of Counseling Services at the Anti-Violence Partnership of Philadelphia. Lisa has over 25 years of experience working with diverse urban families and provides individual and group therapy to adults and adolescents at AVP's main office, in the community and also in Philadelphia schools. She works closely with the Philadelphia District Attorney's Office CARES program to respond to the clinical needs of homicide co-victims in close proximity to the time of the crime. Lisa is a licensed clinical social worker and received her MSW from Temple University. Liz Tribelvis is clinical director and co-founder of A Haven and is a registered board certified art therapist and licensed professional counselor. Liz earned her BFA in sculpture with a concentration in art therapy from University of the Arts and her master's in creative arts therapies from Drexel University. Liz began volunteering for hospice while in college and this is where Liz learned that she had a passion for supporting families through grief. Before A Haven, Liz continued volunteering while obtaining both degrees until she became a children's bereavement counselor. Dr. Angela Lavery is a special, special woman and is one of our own at Westchester University. Dr. Lavery is an associate professor with the Graduate Social Work Department at Westchester University. She's a licensed clinical social worker and a fellow in thanatology through the Association for Death Education and Counseling. Dr. Lavery earned her PhD at the University of Denver. And prior to that, she worked as a hospice social worker and grief and bereavement counselor. Earlier in her career, she worked with survivors of crime as well as those awaiting felony sentencing. We are so grateful to you three and look forward to tonight's presentation. Thank you. Um, and I am going to, at this moment, stop sharing my screen and have Dr. Lavery share her screen. Okay, and before we do that, I'm gonna, before I share my screen, we just wanted to share that, um, you know, since we're gonna be discussing the topic of grief and loss, and um, we just wanna briefly mention the importance of caring for oneself. It's not unusual, right, to have strong emotions or feelings that may pop up. Um, when we discuss you know, such topics, we've all in one way or the other been impacted by losses throughout our lives. So be gentle with yourself. Don't judge it if it does, do what you need to do to care for you. Lisa and, and Liz, do you have any other thoughts on that? Or did I cover that okay or? <laughs> okay. You did just fine. Okay, all right. <laughs> so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen so we can kind of look at, um, our objectives and get started. Okay, so here tonight, we're gonna first 
just briefly and quickly go over the different types of loss children and adolescents and their families and communities can experience. Um, we'll also look into at some point the importance of integrative grief and bereavement care for children, adolescents, and families, as well as um, ways that we can work together to provide support to them and how we can collaborate with parents and caregivers and the school system throughout care planning, as well as including follow-up care. And uh, also we're gonna make sure that we spend some time for special considerations around sudden and traumatic losses like homicide, considering retaliatory violence, suicide that children and adolescents may experience. So, as you can imagine, when we're looking at, you know, anything such as this topic, it's important to look at what frameworks are out there. Now we could spend a whole two hours on all the amazing and all the different theories that are out there and frameworks, but we as a group decided on, you know, what ones would we want to draw your attention to in your, if you want to continue to learn more about this work and what are the most helpful is the most helpful to you in your work with families and children, adolescents, and the community. So two of these may be very familiar to you and uh, through your, your the beginning of your education and that's attachment and family systems. But I'm gonna quickly go over uh, three on here that I would love for you to, if you get a chance to spend some more time reading about, and I'm always happy to pass on more of that information if you reach out to me on these next three models. And that's continuing bonds, dual process model, and meaning reconstruction or meaning making. First is um, continuing bonds. And this is, really about efforts to maintain an ongoing connection to the individual who's, who has died. And so um, this is one of them that I just love and I think has been really helpful to me in my work with um, individuals and, and families. And I put some examples up here from a wonderful article by Root and Exline um, on when they talked about this, um, the attempts and the rituals and different things that we do to try and have that ongoing inner relationship with the person that we've lost. And here's just, again, some of those examples, which are, um, it may be as simple as us going to a grave site to, to bring flowers to them, but also maybe on um, when anniversaries come up, sometimes you'll hear families say, well, we make mom's favorite meal on her birthday to remember her. Or um, I've heard uh, folks say too that um, doing things that the person used to love to do in celebration and remembering them, that might be going for a walk in their favorite park or volunteering the day. They, maybe they were a huge animal lover and volunteered at an animal shelter. They may go and spend the afternoon on the anniversary of the death of their loved one to go volunteer at a shelter. So here's just some examples, some more examples of that. And the thing that we like to discuss in class when I'm talking, bringing this up, is that at one time, some of these things that you see on here, whether that's keeping possessions that once belonged to the person who's, who's gone, there, every now and then in the past, there, was, there were times where people would have thought that some of this stuff was um, not letting go or moving on, but we know better now that these things are part of our coping and can be very helpful to us in, in our, our healing. So um, the other one that I really feel is really important to uh, bring up with folks um, and, and students is the dual process model when I'm teaching about grief and loss. And then you kind of think of um, a fan, right? That oscillates, that goes back and forth that you turn on in your room. And, and it, this is about um, the importance of thinking about two different coping processes, as you see here, a loss oriented one, and a restoration oriented one. And this is, um, again, it's natural for us to go back and forth between this after we've experienced 
a loss, these different coping methods. It's kind of like a step forward. There's progress. We're doing some new things. We're, we're um, uh, making some attempts to adapt without that loved one. And then we have days where we get pulled back in, maybe that step back, right? That's where a grief, a grief intrudes on us suddenly and strongly, right? So that wave might come back and, and grab us. It's completely natural and normal. So as providers, as counselors, we try to normalize that and validate those experiences of that going back and forth between these two coping methods. Okay. And then um, the last model that I just wanted to call your attention to before I go back and ask Lisa and Liz if they have any other thoughts on these models or any of them that we're going over is the um, meaning reconstruction. And again, this is um, a huge theory and framework that I would um, recommend to learn more about. I have um, attended Robert Niemeyer's trainings across the country and, and got most of his books. And he is a wonderful educator uh, on, around grief and loss. And um, so I'm gonna read you just a few things from, from his work. And this is again about making sense out of, um, you know, we just as people, we like to make sense out of events in our life, right? No matter what it is, that's how our brains are, you know? And so um, this is, it's a natural thing that the desire of us to kind of try and get some structure or coherence on the disorder or chaotic things that happen to us from time to time. But I wanted to write, read something to you quick. Um, according to Niemeyer, meaning reconstruction includes the attempt to find or create new meaning for the life of the survivor, as well as the death of the loved one. And um, he, he says that there's three principles at the heart of processes of meaning reconstruction. And, and one is that the grieving entails re reaffirming or reconstructing a world of meaning that has been challenged by loss. Two, adaptation to bereavement typically involves redefining rather than relinquishing um, a continued bond with the deceased. And then the, we, there's this third element that he says is really important when he does meaning reconstruction in session with folks. And that's the use of narratives restoring and storytelling. Um, uh, so he that's one of the ways that he does that. So before I kind of exit this brief, very brief, uh, you know, review of these important models for you to consider in your work with children and adolescents and families, Lisa and Liz, do you have any other thoughts on these or any other models you call attention to for folks? Yeah, well, when you were talking about continuing bonds, it's something that I think for children and teens, I mean, if you've ever heard about grief is love with nowhere to go. And I think what happens, I mean, specifically with death, but any change is when, when something disappears or isn't there anymore, you know, where does all that love go? And so continuing bonds is a, is a beautiful way to continue to share and communicate with that person or, you know, something that changed. Definitely. Lisa, do you have any thoughts on any of these or anything you wanted to add? Well, just, just to say that, you know, grief is not a linear process. Grief is ever evolving. And grief evolves as we evolve. You know, how we grieve today will not be how we grieve in five years, in a month from now, in two months from now. It, it consistently and constantly changes. And just to remember that the more support any of us has as we are grieving, the likelihood that we will heal becomes greater. And that is particularly true for children and adolescents. Relationships are key, um, you know, just, just like the slide said. Yes, yes, thank you, great. So another thing before we get a little further into um, our talk today is, again, we wanna go over some of the basics. And, and when we're talking about loss, as you know, this can take so many forms, um, not just death, 
But in our work, as, as you know, we, we have children and, and adolescents and families who lose their home for a variety of different reasons, be that poverty, disaster, um, ends of relationships, um, incarceration, uh, foster placement. Um, we have children experience parents or, or grandparents, caregivers losing their jobs. Um, pet loss is huge and can be overlooked. Um, and also we need to really not forget chronic illness for a child or a teen that is, is um, an accident they may have or changes in their body or changes they're seeing in their parent who's been diagnosed with cancer or any other chronic illness. And so I've listed, we've listed here a few different examples, again, to think more about this, whether this is traumatic brain injury from an accident, um, uh, whether the child is going through um, treatment and they're seeing changes in their body from surgery, radiation, chemotherapy, um, whether they're seeing a grandparent that's raising them have cognitive changes because of Alzheimer's disease and the losses associated with that. Um, so uh, here we just have a few different examples of what that um, could, could look like. So it's not always about death that we're providing the support around. Angela, can I also expand Please. on that just a little Jump bit? On in. So on I, in. Think, I think if you often feel very comfortable that grief is experienced, I mean, all of these lists are really big, intense things that happen to each one of us. But I would, I would love for us to leave today also acknowledging that grief can be experienced on, on really whenever there's any loss, transition, or change. And if we can remove the stigma around what grief is like, we can really uh, face that uncomfortability and walk through it in a different way, knowing that grief is a normal natural response to something that has been lost or changed. And so just even thinking as simple of changing a job for the better or getting married could, you know, we often don't wanna think about grief related to getting to married, but there's a lot of change and a lot of things that will, will be different. And so how do we, how can we approach those changes or transitions with the rituals that we, we learn about how we process grief in, in more of these big traumatic ways, but that also applies and can help us walk through grief in all these more, even positive changes or, I mean, we can really use the tools that we learn tonight um, to help all of us move through life because there's always change and transitions too. Just, just wanting to normalize that grief, grief carries such a heavy connotation, but mm -hmm. it's also just a natural response to change. Yes, absolutely. Great, great, thank you. Okay, so another thing that we wanted to make sure, we've got a couple other things around grief and loss that we need to just, again, bring up and disenfranchise grief and loss. Um, this is something that um, uh, Dr. Doka um, has spent a, a ton of time and work on, and I was so lucky to get him to do see another one of his trainings last year. He's fantastic, if you ever get the opportunity. Um, and this is how he defines this is the grief that people experience when they incur a loss that is not or cannot be openly acknowledged, publicly mourned or socially supported. And when you read his work, he talks about this in three primary ways. He says that this sometimes comes in the form of the type of loss is not recognized, the type of relationship is not recognized or the grievers themselves are not recognized. And so um, sometimes with this process, it, ha it can be about stigma being involved um, or also just it's it, uh, another thing that Knight and Gitterman is an, is an article that we go over in class and we're all going over this in class in the next couple of weeks um, for our MSW program. But Knight and Gitterman talk about the importance of um, disenfranchisement results because of the socially constructed 
nature of grief, right? So um, uh, we were talking this week about suicide quite a bit in class and how, um, again, the stigma involved with that loss and um, the hesitation sometimes about folks and, and approaching families and and um, how to uh, reach out to them after a suicide loss. And even that we still as a society sometimes even whisper suicide or, or don't even say the word sometimes when we're communicating about that loss. So does this, does this make sense, Lisa or, or Liz? Do you have any other thoughts on the disenfranchisement of some losses? Yeah, and I was thinking too that, you know, when we think about the stigma that's associated not just with death, but with other, with other kinds of losses. When you think about homelessness, um, for many years, I've worked with homeless adolescents and homeless families. And oftentimes children and adolescents, you know, they will say that I live with, you know, my aunt or I live with my cousin. Very rarely will they admit that they are homeless. And for them, as long as they have a place to stay, then they are not homeless. They will rarely acknowledge or identify homelessness as their state of living. And it's really, really important that we pay attention to that because that is a significant trauma and a significant loss as well. Um, when we think about homicide, again, we're talking about a very stigmatized loss. You already mentioned suicide. You know, when we think about the loss of a same-sex partner, when we think about grievers not getting the supports that they need, all of these issues come into play. So I, I really appreciate, um, I really appreciate the slide um, because these are issues that we're faced with regularly. Absolutely. So I'm gonna turn it over to Lisa for a little bit here. About social determinants of health and the ACEs study. One of the things that we have learned um, with respect to how poverty, racism, we can include sexism, we can, we can include uh, xenophobia, we can include a variety of different issues, but we're talking about limited access, limited access for people to get the supports, the services and the help that they need to be able to heal and be able to move forward. And we know that when we start experiencing traumatic events early on in life, that those traumatic e events and experiences over the course of time, if unaddressed, can lead to internalized health issues. We know that they can lead to cardiovascular disease. All of these are social determinants of health. Cardiovascular disease, hypertension, diabetes, obesity, and we know that long term, that if left untreated, all of these conditions can result in an early death. And we see this being played out in our communities regularly. We see that women, particularly women of color, African American women specifically, face a higher rate of cardiovascular disease that results in death. We know that breast cancer among people of color, women of color, is problematic. And many of these conditions, many of these issues are definitely linked to and correlate with issues of poverty, issues of access to affordable health care, issues of access for, for the basics of life, affordable housing. You know, this is 2022 in the United States of America, and we are still grappling with all of these issues that converge 
they converge on multiple levels across systems, between systems. And we need to be really, really clear about how we are dealing with and approaching families who are grieving and children who are grieving. And, and one thing that I wanted to stress is that anytime we are dealing with issues of trauma, we need to stop thinking about trauma in terms of just dealing with the identified patient. Whenever we see a child and adolescent who has experienced a trauma, we then know that that family is traumatized. We then know that 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 community in which they live has now been traumatized. These issues are systemic and we need to broaden our thinking about how systemic inequities are playing out and doing things and engaging with in, engaging people and families in ways that provide empathetic engagement, in ways that, re, that, that reduce the risk of re-traumatization across all the domains in which they deal. We need to be advocates in addition to just providing support services. We're talking about advocacy within our agencies, within our institutions that, that, that can promote healing and can promote trauma-informed care and ways of, of engaging families that are going to be holistic. I promise I'll get to the next slide. It's being a little stubborn at the moment. Here, let me try something. I think it was, it sits for a long time every now and then it'll uh, do this to me. Hold on a second. Okay, I'm gonna share again. Sorry about this, we'll get it fixed really quick. There we go. When we think about the, you know, the children and adolescents and, and, and the topic here is children and adolescents but we cannot think about children and adolescents without them being in the context of family. It is imperative that we keep children, adolescents, males, particularly males of color. As we do our work, we need to keep them in the context of the family and not remove them from that context because many of our services do just that. And when we think about intersectionality, we know that people live multiple layered identities based on historical context. And they operate along between and along structures of power. And people can be simultaneous, people can simultaneously experience oppression and privilege at the same time. Could you go to the next slide, please? We added this slide about trauma and social location to make a point that when we are working with families, we know that we can no longer talk about families just with the concept of how that how they experience an adverse ex experience, how children or adolescents had an adverse experience. This is the original, on my left is the original ACEs pyramid. But we know through research, we know that we can no longer just think about families with respect to how adverse childhood experiences began. We need to think about families with respect to their historical trauma, their embodiment of historical trauma. For Native Americans, we know that they experienced genocide in this country. 
we know that for African Americans, they experienced, they were enslaved, and that enslavement has ripple effects through the generations. For Native Americans, we know that it has ripple effects through the generations. For Japanese Americans, same thing. Ripple effects through the generations. And we need to keep that in context to what is going on now with families. We can no longer, we no longer have the luxury of saying that children are only impacted by an adverse experience. We have to start with that generational context. And then we have to pay attention to implicit bias. We have to pay attention to microaggressions. And we have to pay attention to our own biases because we all have them. We come with bias. And we have to make sure that we can reflect on what that bias is and be able to process it and manage it in a way that does not cause harm to the people in which we're working. And after we you know, begin to process and think about the historical context, we then wanna to go to what is the local context? What are people experiencing now? What are the inequities that people are experiencing? And then we can think about what allostatic load is. Allostatic load, you know, when we're talking about social determinants of health, we're talking about that cumulative effect that all of these experiences have had on each and every one of us, not just our clients, but on all of us. And once we understand how those experiences impact us, we need to then begin engaging in self-care. We need to teach our families to engage in self-care. How are we going about um, providing or getting access to medical care? Preventative care is crucial. And when we're talking about issues of loss and grief, one of the things that we do at AVP is encourage anyone who has experienced the sudden traumatic loss of a friend, family member, um, acquaintance. We need to encourage people to say, hey, listen, I need you to get your blood pressure checked. I need you to think about how you're internalizing these experiences that you've had. How are you internalizing the grief that you're experiencing? And for people who don't have health care, for people who say, well, look, I don't have a primary care. Prior to COVID, what we were doing is encouraging people, listen, if you live near a, Wal a Walgreens, Rite Aid, or CVS, they all have free blood pressure monitoring. Go in there, sit down, put your arm in the cuff, let it register your blood pressure. And you explain to people, 120 over 80 is normal. If that bottom number is elevating to 90 or, or above, then you're running into the territory of high blood pressure. If it's extremely high, then we wanna be encouraging people, listen, you need to go get yourself checked out. Encourage people to make doctor's appointments. Those preventative things can go a long way. And then we wanna talk about how these experiences can impact them long-term. Not because we wanna frighten and scare people half to death, but we want to give people information in which they can understand and be able to act for the benefit and the, and the future, not just of themselves, but of their children and families. We internalize a great deal. And, and we also wanna borrow from information that we know, such as trauma-focused psychological first aid. We know that the act of drinking water, plain old tap water, we know that drinking tap, 
sorry, drinking water goes a long way to flush excessive amounts of cortisol and other stress hormones from the body. We need to be sharing that information, not just with our colleagues, but our clients as well. We know that in addition to drinking water, getting fresh air, the combination of, of drinking water and fresh air lowers anxiety. It helps to eliminate stress hormones. And coupled with that, and, and the last thing we want to be teaching people is in combination with the water, in combination with the fresh air, you want to be able to guard and support your sleep hygiene. And for many clients who talk about having issues of safety when they're sleeping, I encourage this. You may not be able to control if, when, and how you go to sleep, but you can control when you rest. So for as much as possible, we want people to be able to carve out times where they can get some rest. And I just, you know, we didn't talk about this in our, in our meeting, but I wanted to share that. And I typically share this information in most of my trainings because it is important that we give people easy tools. These are tools that are virtually free. They don't require anything other than people's time, effort, and energy to think about. And, and I worked for many years at Simon Grant's Mastery Charter, and I teach this to my kids. And in return, many of them will say to me, Miss Lisa, you know, there's an app for that. I'm old school. I didn't know anything about having an app um, that would remind you to drink water. But some of my kids were coming back to me and they were sharing, you know, feed the plant app. And they were showing me how to download it on my phone and how to use it. To, as a reminder to drink water, to give people accurate information for their well-being, they will, they will grasp it. They will hold on to it. And many of my kids, when I walk the hallways, you know, of, of grass, they would oftentimes, you know, slyly show me their water bottles. I got my water bottle, Miss Lisa. I'm drinking my water, Miss Lisa. And I encourage them to share that information with your families, share it with your mom, share it with your dad, your grandparents. They need to have this information as well. Okay. And this slide is important because it talks about or, or, or it, it depicts many of the issues in addition to the grief, in addition to loss that people experience. Cultural beliefs, issues dealing with social media, having access to healthy food, access to clean drinking water. Again, you know, we're, we're now into a new year and there are still states in this country that are struggling with having clean access to clean drinking water. Dealing with mental health issues, veterans issues, and we could go on and on, but I just wanted to highlight the, highlight the fact that in the backdrop of everything our families bring, they're bringing some of these issues as well. And I just wanted to highlight that um, during this training. So thank you. I know I've gone on, but I, I just want to thank you uh, indulging me and in, in sharing that. Oh, well, that's wonderful. Thank you, Lisa. That's fantastic. So pretty soon here, I'm going to, uh, we're going to switch and, and turn over to, to Liz here too. But we also wanted to briefly also mention um, ambiguous losses. Can you hear me okay? I heard a little scratchiness, okay. So these losses too, when we're thinking about working with families and individuals and, and children in the community, it's these are losses that aren't easily defined or recognized that are, um, and, they're, and the other important part that kind of um, stands out about ambiguous losses that they are ongoing. 
in nature, okay? So um, uh, you might think of this when we have a mis missing person situation, um, when um, there's traumatic brain injury and now um, a, a spouse or a parent suddenly finds themselves in a caregiver role for a very, very, very long time with an adult child or, or young uh, spouse. You also see this with uh, co-victims of uh, homicide as they're awaiting investigation to, to try and determine who murdered their loved one, their, ch their child, um, family member. You see this in dementia um, and see how, um, you know, when you have a, a loved one who is there physically, they're present, but yet they're no psych psychologically, it's just, it's, it's so different and it's ongoing for a long period of time. So uh, Lisa and Liz, did you have any other thoughts about this ambiguous loss before we move on? So when you know, we're talking about COVID from the time side, um, I just want to reiterate the fact that in the city of Philadelphia, as with many urban cities, homicides are not being resolved through the arrest. You know, we can talk about oftentimes wanting families to have closure. With COVID victimization, homicides, there's oftentimes no closure. Because less than 37% of homicides are resulting in an arrest for a variety of reasons. But I just wanted to add that. You were a little fuzzy, Lisa. We'll see if that continues. If not, we may have you, we may have to have you. Um, we'll get our team on it and see if we can get it fixed. If not, we may have to have you log in and out again. We'll see. They'll they'll let you know. But it was really, really fuzzy. But thank you. I think we were able to make some of that out. We can do a follow-up to um, later if anyone had trouble hearing that. Okay, here we go, let's see. All right, and then lastly, to another uh, element we wanted to bring up was um, anticipatory grief and mourning. And this is when um, we're uh, looking at it refers to grief experiences that take place prior to, but in connection with a significant loss that is expected to take place, but has not yet occurred. Um, so when you get a, a, a child hears about the terminal diagnosis of their mother who's been diagnosed with stage four cancer, you know, um, this is a, what an example of what anticipatory um, grief and, and mourning may be like. Same thing, like I've used the example of dementia and with Alzheimer's or ALS or something like that. Um, Liz, Lisa, do, do you have more thoughts about this? <clears throat> yeah, I think it's important to note that they have already, they found that there's no amount of anticipatory grief support that will alter or lessen the intensity of grief after a death occurs or the loss happens, but you can, as clinicians, we can support families and children and teens through anticipatory grief to actually equip them well to have less unresolved issues, guilt, um, to go in fully knowing that they were able to express everything that they wanted to. Um, so though it doesn't change the actual grief experience or the intensity of the grief pain that's experienced afterwards, it can help uh, lessen the, the amount of it, if that makes sense. So um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tough space to support someone because on the outside, it looks like you could do a lot of work, but you also, you can never, especially with a child, you can never go into like, we need to start grieving your mother now. Well, your mother's not dead yet. And so we also don't want to have that happen either. So it's a tough, it's a tough place to, 
to walk with a family or a child, but it can really be also a very beautiful place where you can provide a lot of support and ways to um, say everything and have no regrets. Yes, absolutely. All right, let's see here. There we go. So yeah, we we um, just wanted to also, you know, look at just remind ourselves about again back to everything that we're considering here um, when we're talking about grief, grief and loss, and epidemics is is part of that. Um, we wanted to make sure we're, we're recognizing the impact of um, overdose deaths, poverty, gun violence, and everything we've been living through, you know, these last two years with the, with the pandemic and all the different losses and the impact on our children and adolescents for all those things that they have lost as a result of that. Any other thoughts here, Lisa and Liz? Okay, all right, let's see here. So Liz, we're gonna turn it over to Liz here for this part. Yeah, so how, how are children and teens different? Um, I think it's really easy to assume that children are experiencing grief the same way we are because that's what we know. Um, but what's children grieve very differently and it can look very different. And so one of the, the major differences is that children dip into grief and they come back out. They're beautifully present in the moment. And if they're reminded of, of the loss, of the change, then they'll dip into that grief and they'll come out. The younger they are, maybe a quicker dip and they come back up. Um, whereas adults, we really just marinate in the grief and it, it permeates every aspect of our life. And so it can, it can seem like a child isn't actually grieving because they're playing and they're, they're laughing. And what's beautiful is I think we can learn a lot from children and they dip into the grief and they're in it. And then when they're not, they're playing and they're fully present in the moment. And it's such a, it's a gift really to adults in a child's life. We talked about um, the, that the child is not an individual, but a, a part of a system. And so it can actually be helpful to the adults in the child's life to see that dip and to experience even that joy that is, I think, hard for adults to be able to separate the grief is just in every piece. Um, cognitive development directly correlates to how a child grieves. And so it's really their understanding of grief and what their understanding of death will impact what they understand and know and what the grief looks like. And so cognitive development is a is a huge determining factor on how a child grieves. And what's different in children is that it's more of a long-term experience in that children will re-grieve as they develop cognitively and have a different understanding of what that loss means in their life. And so as they develop and as they grow, they will have a greater understanding of what that death means. And so um, it's really a lifelong, I mean, it's lifelong for all of us. And it, and I love how Lisa says it, it matures as we mature and it shifts as we shift, but children, it's, directly connected to brain development. And then it will take the adult form and morph and mature and shift. Um, and so I think it's important for us to not expect children to follow that same year timeline that we often give adults because, you know, you talk about the child's dad dies when they're five and then they hit middle school and they have a deeper understanding of what that means in their life and then graduation and there's huge milestones that happen in a child's life and so you could see in intense grief experiences throughout their whole school year time in school from kindergarten to senior year of high school and I think that's important to note because a death could occur in first grade but you may not see the behavior 
or the typical grief responses until fifth grade, until middle school, until high school. And that's partly because of their brain development. And so as we work with children, I think it's important to remember that as we learn that there was a death experience or a significant traumatic loss in their life, that just because this year they seem to be okay doesn't mean that they will for from now on too, because it will develop and change as they grow. Um, I also with brain development, we think about how our, our prefrontal cortex is not finished growing until our mid 20s. And so you think about all the development that happens in our in our brain development that directly correlates to what grief looks like. So I think it's just important for us to remember that really until we're 24, Grief is going to keep ramping up really through our life, no matter when that, when that loss happens. Um, and we think about the grief experience too, the impulses and everything that the, the prefrontal cortex helps us process grief is not, is not really functioning well until we're in our mid twenties. So the expectation on teens grieving, they seem very adult and yet there's a lot of development in how they experience grief. And, and grief is experienced so intensely that they have less ability to filter their impulses too. And so you think about the behavior of teens and what you can see just to be mindful that, you know, we can't expect them to be with functioning with a fully functioning brain in grief. Um, so I would love to go through just a little brief on child development and what grief may look like and the understanding of grief, because I think it can help as we're, as we're working with different ages to just have that even understanding of what grief may look like and how to support them. What I find is very fascinating is that grief, a baby can grieve. So if a child is able to look the object permanence. If a child is able to look for an object that disappears, they're old enough to grieve. So that's about six months old that even babies grieve. And I think that's an important thing to realize. Babies and families are often the ones that are just kind of put aside and and yet really by six months, a, a child is old enough to grieve. So I think that's a, an important note. Um, however, with toddlers and babies, obviously with their development, they are completely unable to understand that death is permanent. Um, this is an important part in working with families in general is equipping the adults, the schools to know that a child may keep asking for that person because they're unable to understand that death is a permanent thing. And so that's also why it's really helpful to be clear and use the word death, dying, died. Because even if we say um, grandma went to heaven, it's important to say grandma died and went to heaven because heaven could be a, a separate place so why did, why did grandma go to a grocery store and not come back to me? It can be really confusing um, if we don't use what the word died. It passed away, we pass a paper, we pass a ball. Um, it's, it's very uh, words that we use to try to soften the, the blow and the pain of grief. And yet um, it makes it really confusing for kids. And, and little ones really don't have any emotional connotation for what that word means. It's really a way we can serve them to be very clear um, so they can understand. And I always say that little kids will stop asking where dad is, where brother is, when they realize that they're not coming back. And that's when they start to know what death means. And so just to equip parents and, and caregivers to be prepared for those constant questions because as Lisa brought up that everyone is traumatized, so are the adults in the room and they may not wanna be triggered in the moment when the little one's asking where that person is. And so to be mindful of, of all of those pieces. Um, so to be prepared for repetitive questions, ma maintaining a routine is really important for babies and toddlers 
babies obviously can't communicate. They're fully at the emotional whims of everyone. And so maintaining their routines can be a basic um, structure that can help them feel safe and just play, play it out and, and be with them. Uh, play is how they process. We all know this. Behavior is how kids communicate and play is how they process. And so meeting them where they are um, and knowing that they will dip in and out really quickly. We've had, I've had very intense conversations talking to children about their dad telling, um, helping mom talk about dad dying by suicide. And, um, you know, as an adult, you're expecting this big, intense conversation. And, and the little one was like, oh, okay. Uh, when is he coming home? And then trying to explain that he died. And then, and then they're playing because that's all they need in that moment. And they'll ask questions when they're confused and being able to meet them where they are and answer the questions clearly and simply when they ask it is way better than trying to give them more information because they won't be able to hear it all at once. And the older that they get, the more information they can hold. Um, Angela and Lisa, did you want to add anything to that? I saw Angela nodding. No? Okay. So when we move into kindergarten and younger elementary school, they, that age really starts to begin to understand that death is permanent. And they also start to see that death is more global. So it's not just my immediate experience, but also death can happen more globally. Um, they want, may want to know way more details about what it means, what it looks like, um, what the body looks like, and it's very cognitive and all factual, and it's just because they're trying to figure out all the information. And so um, it may be actually less emotional and more cognitive in just trying to figure out what does this mean? And does this happen to everyone? We see a lot more um, clinginess to other members of the family because now we know that death doesn't just happen to this person, but could happen to you and you and you and you. And so not really wanting to let caregivers out of their sight um, because they don't want that to happen again. And so um, magical thinking is still there. And so you can really, I mean, the stress and the anxiety can build um, and you see a lot of clinginess and that's normal and natural because they're starting to realize that death is global. And so it's, it's bigger than just um, their experience. Um, giving them a space and, and letting them ask questions. I think it's really important for us to meet a child where they are and ask, answer the, the information that they actually need to feel safe um, and, and the information that they really need. I think we often want to say the right thing and, and not mess up those conversations because we feel a lot of weight. Um, but I don't, I don't think we can ever fully understand what's happening in a child's mind to, to meet, how can we help them feel safe and heard and seen? It's answering their questions and, and really stopping at that. Um, I go back to the, the example of sitting with a mom and helping the mom uh, tell her two daughters that their dad died by suicide. Um, and I, this moment just sits with me so vividly because um, it was so unexpected. And I think it's a really good example of like, we can never, we don't know what a child needs in that moment. And all we can do is tend to the, the tension of that moment and help relieve their fears and help them feel safe. And so, um, you know, we asked, we told them, your dad died by suicide. Um, and we asked if they had any questions. And the youngest one who was four said, well, was daddy wearing his favorite shirt? For her, all she wanted to do was be able to picture him in his favorite shirt. And for him, for her, she just wanted to know that, you know, well, was he wearing his favorite shirt? And and I loved that, that experience because it's like, oh, I never in a million years would have been able to come up with something that would have supported that. And she, 
she led us directly into that and we could then talk about it. Um, and, and she could describe the favorite shirt. And then there was, there was some, she was trying to create an image in her mind of her dad. Um, and then the seven-year-old was asking about their finances and if they would have to be out of their home. Again, that's not the first place I would have thought that she needed to have support. And yet they led the conversation and we were able to, in the moment, be able to support both of those questions and help them feel safe and secure in that moment, knowing that and equipping mom that there will be many questions, other questions to come. But I love that that example because you can't, you don't know until a child asks the question and it's far better to give less information and have the child actually let you know, well, what they're thinking about and then you can meet them there. So I just thought that was beautiful. Um, we move into older elementary school and preteen. Um, they fully understand the permanence of deaths, of permanence of death. Um, they're able to use words. They're way more verbal in how they talk about grief. Um, they know more about spiritual beliefs and you start to see more existential questions about what death means and more existential wrestling with what, what does that look like? Um, this is really when peers are begin to be the most helpful um, because they're starting to separate from the adults in their life and find impact in peers too. Um, again, teaching self-care, healthy coping, um, normalizing grief. This is all um, you know, woven throughout every age. Um, and then teens are really, I mean, they're as adults are in understanding grief, except for that they are focusing in on the present because they don't, they're not able to actually think of the long term consequences of the choices that they're making. And so if they are reacting, this is where support, I think, is, is incredibly important um, because they may be more autonomous to make some big decisions in reaction to their grief. Um, that can have long-term consequences. And so having a space to be able to talk about that and a, and a space to be able to um, process that with someone else outside of their, their system can be helpful. Um, so just a couple tips to be present and listen. I think we, we underestimate just how much a relationship can provide to children in grief and knowing that not all children have a, a healthy environment to go back to. And so, um, you know, what can we do as clinicians to provide that safe space for them? So what can we do to equip parents? Um, I think it's, I mean, we, we talked about how children and teens are not an individual and they are a part of a, a bigger whole. And so how can we holistically support a child and teen? And it's really um, including the adults in that child or teen's life, because we know that an, an one of the number one determining factors on how a child grieves is how the adults in their life are grieving. And so what is the environment? Um, can, can the parents or adults hold that grief and process grief? Um, I know a lot of my work in hospice, I did a lot of anticipatory grief support and then after a death. And what I found um, after a hospice patient died the adults were almost unable to walk into their grief until they knew that their child was, was going to be okay. I think um, we are hardwired and have a natural instinct, which is why our human nature has lasted this long to protect our young and to protect children from pain. And so I think it awakens all of these things in us to try to protect children from pain. And we think about adults in, in, in children's lives. Um, 
that it's really stressful. And I found many, many adults who were care, caregiving for children, they were unable to actually process their own grief or even get started until they knew that they they knew some way of supporting their child. And so I think it's, um, it's essential that as we work with children, we also equip the adults in the child life, knowing that, um, you know, one hour a week, even the school day that children are still going somewhere else. Um, and what can we, we do to help that environment um, and educate with grief? I think psychoeducation, education and normalizing grief, no, normalizing child development and grief is really important. And also just calling out that it is really hard to see a child hurt, but grief is normal and natural. And, and being able to see that not all behaviors are pathological um, when it's related to grief. And I think we can often see behaviors and, and fast forward into some really intense behaviors and choices. And it does start with like a quick little behavior shift. Um, but can we normalize the experience of grief for children for parents and caregivers and grandparents um, and give and empower them to be able to talk about their loved one. It's okay to cry around a child. It's okay for a child to even let, let them help you and support you. Um, it gives them a sense of control, which helps with their resilience too. Um, you know, hugs, they can, they can be a part of, of that process too. Um, educating on words, death, dying, um, how to talk about death is really important. Um, I think it's, a, it's sometimes a catch-22 because really the health of the adults in the child's life and how they're grieving in a healthy way determines the health of the child, but then also like the, the adult wants to make sure that the child is okay before they go into their own health too. So it's really a simultaneous support at the same time. Lisa and Angela, do you have anything else to add? I would just um, echo and, and I really appreciate you talking about the, the health of the caregiver, the health of the parent or the grandparent, um, because oftentimes um, what I see is that I have to provide encouragement for the parent, the caregiver, the grandparent, um, to let them know that it's okay to express grief in front of their children, in front of their family, especially when we're talking about men and males. You know, this notion that they do not want to be perceived as weak that they want to be strong for their families. You know, we need to be encouraging that you can still be strong for your family and cry at the same time or need a hug at the same time, that that's okay. And, and, and we also have to pay attention to the cultures in which we're working with. You know, what does the family bring? and asking questions about how they are grieving. You know, we, we hear all these stories about fathers who are going to their car or going to their truck late at night because they just need a quiet, safe space to be able to cry. We want to discourage that and encourage them to rely on their loved ones, rely on their family members, their extended family members? Who are their social supports through this process? Making them known, coming up with a list of who they are. Who can be your one go-to? And, and, and this should go without saying, but sometimes we get so mired in how people are grieving that we pay very little attention to trying to instill a sense of hope that their grief will be transformative and they'll be able to come out on the other side. And I, I just wanted to add that. So, so thank you, um, 
that's what that's what your presentation is evoked in me. Um, when we're talking about sudden traumatic loss, um, especially as it relates to issues of homicide, suicide, and retaliatory violence, I know that the schools in particular grapple with these issues. And I just want to highlight um, a few things here. Anytime we're dealing with loved ones, family members, extended family members of someone who has died as a result of homicide. They are called co-victims of homicide. They are co-victims because they share in that process. They share in that grief process. And not just the grief, but the trauma that goes along with it. When we're talking about when we're talking about schools, we know that oftentimes adolescents in particular find out about homicides of peers. They find out about the homicide or the shooting of someone that they care about literally while they're in school. And we have to make special consideration for that and understand that schools need training, not just in trauma, but how will schools respond to these issues collectively in a way that is not re-traumatizing, in a way that respects what has occurred and how the school can deal with this in a way that is going to be holistic in a way that will take under consideration, not just what the student is going through, but what the peers are going through and how the teachers are experiencing these kinds of issues. The teachers, the support staff, the administrators, anytime there is a homicide of a student, all of these people are impacted. Crossing guards are impacted. And we need to be able, each school system needs to be able to come up with a way to be able to process these issues and talk about these issues and have a strategy for being able to move forward in letting all of the student body know what's going on. And I also wanted to pay special attention to issues of retaliatory violence because we know that in the city of Philadelphia, particularly, particularly last July, I'm sorry, particularly in, in, in January from 2021 until May of 2021, we know that a large percentage of homicides that occurred in the city of Philadelphia were as a direct result of retaliatory violence. And we need to be able to have access to supports that the schools can tap into to address issues of retaliatory violence once we know what is happening. If we are aware, if we are made aware that a student or students are thinking about engaging in behavior that will lead to retaliatory violence, we need to have access to supports in real time. And I just want to let you know, and, and this is going to, we're going to talk about this in more detail later, but there are agencies and organizations in the city that we can tap into that can help with retaliatory issues in real time. And, and also with issues of suicide. When, when, when a student, when a staff person, um, or a teacher has committed suicide, we need to, again, have strategies for schools. You know, it used to be a question of, well, you know, if something happens. 
we are beyond that point. We know that it's not a question of if, it is a question of when. I don't know a school in the city of Philadelphia that has not been impacted by the homicide of a student or their loved one or staff person. And there are specific things that can be put in place. And we have helped and worked with and collaborated with schools across the city to be able to come up with plans and strategies that will address these issues. And I, I just wanted to speak to that. Um, and, and if we could go to the next slide, that would be helpful. This is a quote um, by Dr. Bruce Perry um, in his book called um, The Boy Who, I'm, I'm sorry, The Boy Who Thought He Was a Dog. Um, he speaks to this, to what we now know is crucial for the healing of children and adolescents. The more sound supports in terms of family, in terms of extended family, caregivers, coaches, um, faith-based uh, faith communities, the more supports we can give to children no matter what treatment modality we choose to engage them with, that has the most impact with respect to how children heal and how children and adolescents move forward. And we need to keep that in mind um, as we're working with children. We constantly wanna think about who are their social supports? Who are the resources that we can use, even if it's just one or two? We still need to be able to identify that. Uh, could you go to the next slide, please? Um, there's an exercise that we want to present, um, and it's entitled Scooter's Family. And I'm going to read you a case scenario. Um, and I, I, I want you, as I'm reading it, to really think systemically not just about how the death of Scooter's father is impacting Scooter, but I want you to think systemically how this death is impacting other people as we read, as I read um, the scenario to you. And I also want you to think about some questions. I want you to think about identifying who needs support and who needs intervention? What types of services would you recommend? And also identify community resources that provide trauma support to individuals and families impacted by gun violence. So I'm going to read it now. And um, I, I'm, I'm curious as to how people are going to process this. And the case reads as follows. Scooter is an 11 year old African American child who is enrolled in the fifth grade at a mastery charter school in walking distance of his home in the Germantown section of the city. He came to the attention of his school social work team after a few of his close peers reported that his father was the victim of a fatal shooting after being hit by gunfire while on his way home from work. Two of those peers live on the same block as Scooter and share a close relationship, excuse me one second, I'm sorry. Can people hear me? Um, is my mic not working at all? We can hear you. Okay. All right, I'm gonna continue then. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna go back to two of his peers. Two of those peers live on the same block as Scooter and share a close relationship with Scooter and his family. 
they affectionately referred to Schooner's father as Big Jim. He was 43 years of age, married and worked full time. He was devoted to his son, his family and community. He often spent time coaching and mentoring youth in soccer and basketball. Since his father's death in October, Scooter has been struggling academically. He has excessive school absences. When he does attend school, he's often irritable, argumentative, and hypervigilant. In addition, he reports somatic complaints resulting in calls being made to his mother. The school social worker has been in contact with his mother who express concern that he is becoming more distant from his siblings and peers. He is also wetting the bed at night and occasionally has toileting accidents during the day. He cries easily and when asked how he is doing, he reports that it doesn't matter. Her oldest son, Jim Jr., age 14, is having issues as well. He expresses a sense of foreshortened life expectancy and often talks about wanting to retaliate against the people he perceives as responsible for the death of his father. His school attendance has been sporadic and he too displays an I don't care attitude. His mother is fearful for her son's safety because she does not know what else to do. And as we think about this case, as we think about the issues that are confronting this family, I'm just curious as to how we are identifying who needs support and intervention. And when I asked you to think about these issues systemically, know that Scooter is the identified patient or the identified person in this system. But I want you to recall what I had talked about earlier in the presentation, that anytime you had a traumatized child or adolescent, you then have a traumatized family. You then have a traumatized block or neighborhood. And you then have a traumatized community. Scooter is definitely traumatized. But so is Scooter's siblings. So are the siblings who reported to the teachers and to the school staff that Scooter's father was a victim of a homicide. So that system can definitely use intervention and support. We know that when we're talking about the mother having concerns for not just Scooter, but her other son and her other children as well. They need support and intervention. We know that the families on the block in which he lived, in which the family lived, needs intervention and support. And we also know that the kids that he coached, the kids that he mentored, can use uh, support and intervention. And that's what I mean about thinking systemically. This notion that only the identified person in a family system gets help and support. We have to do away with that notion. And when we're talking about working with kids in schools, many of us know that oftentimes a kid who may be identified as a co-victim, be it homicide, be it suicide, whatever it is, we know that they oftentimes 
have other siblings who may be attending schools in different parts of the city. And not only attending different schools, but also they may be in different school systems. And when that happens, we have to have ways of communicating with those other schools to find out if all of the children are receiving similar supports based on the relationship they have with the family system. It's imperative to do that. And when we're talking about what types of services are recommended, we know that grief support can be recommended. We know that trauma support can be recommended, but we also need support that deals with the potential for retaliatory violence. And I want to bring to your attention, um, for those of you who may not know, I, I, I want to take, I want to take separately the issues of retaliatory violence. If you know of, if you suspect, or if kids are talking about acting out violently against someone they perceive has harmed their loved one, you can reach out to Philadelphia Ceasefire. You can also reach out to PAN, which stands for Philadelphia Anti-Drug, Anti-Graffiti Network. Those two organizations have people on staff who come from the communities in which these violent acts are occurring. They have access, they have an, a, a, an ability to connect with youth in a way that will help interrupt those cycles and patterns of violence. Now, clearly, they cannot guarantee that retaliatory violence will not occur, but they can certainly have the ability to meet one on one in the communities in which these families are living. And I can tell you that I have used these two resources in abundance. And some of them, particularly Philadelphia Ceasefire, is already in some, in some schools in Philadelphia, particularly the North Philadelphia area, in the Frankfurt area. Please reach out and utilize those resources. It is important because we do not want to see the homicide rate continue. We want to see families get the supports that they need. And with respect to helping neighbors, helping people in the community impacted by these kinds of violence issues, we know that there's network of neighbors who can provide supports, who can provide grief support. And if you contact the network of neighbors, more often than not, they will reach out to their community partners. I am a part of the network of neighbors. Many of the staff at Anti-Violence Partnership are part of the network of neighbors. Some of you may already be a part of the network of neighbors. And the networks, their contact information is listed under resources for this, for this presentation. I would encourage you to use them and not just a network of neighbors, there's also Uplift Center for Grieving Children. There's EMIR, which stands for Every Murder is Real. They also provide grief support and crisis intervention. And I can tell you that for my time, my past six and a half years at AVP, I have worked with all of these organizations in communities where these issues are occurring. And we come together to provide the supports that are needed in real time. And I also want to remind people, especially people 
who are working with families and communities. When a homicide occurs, please, 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 especially if you are at a school, make sure you have a plan for interacting with the families that are impacted. Families frequently complain about getting calls and getting supports and visits from multiple agencies. They also complain about schools. You know, 10 people may be reaching out to them from one school. Pick one person, one designated person, or two people, especially if you're going to the home, to be the ones who are going to be the point of contact for the family. Families do not benefit from multiple calls and multiple visits by multiple individuals from the same agency or the same school. They can't keep track of it. And it's really, when we talk about strategy, that's part of it. And again, if you need a response, the response does not have to be immediately following the homicide. People need a chance to let the dust settle. They're going to be very preoccupied with going to the medical examiner's office to identify their loved one, making arrangements, talking to detectives. They do not have the capacity oftentimes to be able to have an intervention plan prior to a funeral service. And I can't emphasize that enough because in our desire to want to help the family, we sometimes cause harm because we are demanding that resources be made and dispatched immediately without the family having an opportunity to come together to be able to talk about what the issues are and what their needs are. They need to have time to figure out what is going to be important to them moving forward, be it, be it help with and support with food, be it help and support with maintaining a place to stay, having utilities. All of those things take precedent. And also considering their own safety needs. All of these things are going to be important. And I'm going to, um, I'm going, I'm looking at the um, screen that, the slide that um, Angela put up. Thank you, Angela. Um, because these are all resources that uh, you can um, access. Depending on which part of the city, depending on which part of the county, which county that you're living in. Yes, and, and as Lisa stated, we have pulled together a handout for you all. It's almost ready. It's going to have everything that Lisa just mentioned, the, um, the organizations. Um, we have a link, and when we have a brief description of each of these places on the handout, we're just finishing it up, but our um, Dr. Janiel and Wendy will have this to be able to, to get to you. Thank you so much. And we've got about um, 10 minutes for questions and answers. And Fatima Bakayoko, our graduate assistant, is, um, is going to ask some of the questions that folks have been um, putting in the Q&A. And hopefully we'll have some time following tonight's presentation to also record something else from, um, from some of you. and upload to our YouTube channel, that would be really incredible. So Fatima, I'm going to turn this over to you and um, I'm going to let you kind of lob some questions out there to um, Lisa and Dr. Lavery and to Liz and I'm um, going to mute myself. Okay, thank you, Dr. Tanu. So the first question is, can you all speak to how losses related to migration and family separation fit into the concepts we learned about tonight?
know that um, we know that migration issues, um, when we're talking about systemic inequities, we know that particularly this past year and a half, we have seen a surge um, in anti-immigrant, um, in anti-immigration issues, um, particularly as it relates to people of color. Um, and we also know that that can be considered as a disenfranchised loss. Um, we don't often recognize people um, who've migrated, who've immigrated, who face deportation, who face constant, the constant threat of immigration issues. Um, that is a very stressful experience. It is a very traumatic experience. Um, and and um, there are supports. There's HIAS. Um, I, don't, I don't know if people are familiar with HIAS. Um, there are other organizations out there um, that can provide support. AVP does provide support um, to immigrants who have experienced um, the loss as, as it relates to um, deportation um, and immigration issues. Um, so I, I hope that's helpful for you. Thank you. And the next question is, could you please address how disenfranchised and isolated adolescents can best find out about where or how to get the help with their bereavement and grief issues? What are the best practices and outreach to these groups at the school level? At the school level, um, I would encourage people to connect with their school social worker or school counselor. Um, many of them have resources that are available that they can access. And they can also, um, for mo most kids are tech savvy, um, they can also access these services. And there are also um, text lines that can be utilized as well. I don't, I don't, have, the, um, I don't have the service memorized, um, but there are definitely text lines and there are crisis lines that, that kids, adolescents can, can access on their own. Um, and Liz, I can, I can forward that information to you. I would also like to say that from a school level, um, multiple organizations listed here. So a Haven, which I co-founded in Chester County, Peters Place in Radnor, um, Safe Harbor in Abington and Center for Loss and Bereavement, they all facilitate grief and loss groups within the school, um, as well as offer virtual and in-house, in in-person support as well. So a lot of times that, and I know Uplift goes into the schools as well in Philadelphia. Um, I'm sorry that I missed that. I was looking at the list. But we all are a collaboration together and really working to ensure that no child grieves alone. And so we're, we're really, our goal is to support the greater Philadelphia area and make sure that every child has access to grief support in some way. And so um, these are our organizations that you can reach out. And I know that um, Uplift, A Haven, Peters Place, Safe Harbor, Center for Loss and Bereavement are offered at no cost. So they're completely free. I think that's also an important piece to note. And some of them, I know Uplift does groups at schools. AVP does groups at schools. Um, particularly Mastery Charter Schools um, and Philadelphia County Schools as well. Okay, thank you both for sharing those. The next question is, are there any suggestions or research to support neurodiverse children in coping with grief and loss? I have some information on this and I wish I had it prepared for tonight, but, and I, I don't know what Lisa and Liz's experiences are, but um, yeah, I could um, pull up, uh, I have a really cool um, article specifically in relation to working with schools. Um, and it's brief, it's a nice, easy read and great recommendations. And some of the things that even Liz highlighted in her discussion about developmental uh, considerations reminded me as she's listing those out 
were very similar. And um, especially like the importance of getting back to routine, especially with neurodiverse children and teens, because that can be incredibly important, especially when you look at autism specific, specifically, you know, yes, we have to create that space at school to talk about the loss that's occurred. And there's an example in this article I'm talking about that um, this loss of a sudden loss of a teacher who died tragically. One day is there, the next day is gone. And they, they brought professionals in like Lisa and Liz to discuss that loss, but then also made sure to get right back to the structure that they're used to in the system. So there is, and that's just a brief highlight. I know we're kind of running out of time, but I'd be glad to for that person who has that question and attach it as one of the, the handouts, perhaps. I can, I can get that together. Okay, thank you very much. The next question is, hasn't it been shown that babies who are adopted out of the hospital grieve their birth mother as they know her voice, smell, and heartbeat, and they know, the, and they know those traits are going in their new home. Therefore, can't we grieve from birth on? There, finding the mute. Um, I love that that was brought up because we know that we can have trauma and nonverbal trauma before we even know how to speak. Um, and I would say, yes, I think there is grief and what that speaks, what that speaks to is as you develop and you, you learn how to verbalize that grief, that that's when that grief may start to express. It's not saying that grief is not present, but that you can, you can experience that grief. I mean, I'm even just thinking about, I have a six month old. I'm only now really starting to see their, her temperament. I can even understand her temperament. And so that doesn't mean that there hasn't been trauma before that, but I'm only now just starting to be able to experience her in a different way and, and connect with her in a different way. And so I think um, yes, I agree that grief, I think if we, if we talk about it like that, I think, yes, grief can happen even before trauma can happen even before. Um, I think how we can support an individual may have to wait a little bit longer, um, as a child grows to be able to support that grief. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. So I also have a follow up question to that and thinking about children who have been adopted or removed from the biological family. How do you support this differently, if any way? I mean, I think, I think grief is one thing. But I think also if we think of, you know, what Lisa keeps talking about is this identified patient that this child is also in a new environment. And is that environment a safe place for them to express that grief? Um, and I would see that's where it differs in, in the experience of, of that. Lisa, would you want to speak to I that? No, I totally agree. The how okay. you support grief is I think grief can be supported and experienced no matter what happened in a similar way, um, but it's dependent on the environment around them. Oh, wow. We want to thank you so much, uh, Dr. Lavery and Lisa and Liz. This was incredible. I know we have a bunch of more questions, right, Fatima? <laughs> Um, and I think we're going to get you to meet with us again at some time in the future to tap into some of those great, wonderful questions that we didn't have a chance to get to tonight. But we really want to thank you for your important work and um, just let you know how appreciative we are, especially in this time when we're trying to figure out these unusual ways of presenting information and dealing with technical issues and all those things. So thank you, thank you, thank you, the three of you.